So last week, we kicked off our message series in the book of Hebrews. We started in chapter one, and we learned that the book of Hebrews, we don't know who the author was, and we're kind of fuzzy on who the audience was, but we can draw from clues from the text on who the audience was. It was most likely a small congregation that was struggling in their faithfulness because of looming persecution. They had gone through a season where the Roman Empire had literally crushed the Jewish people, and a period of persecution was coming towards Jewish Christians, Christians in general, but specifically Jewish Christians, which is um, the primary congregation uh, that this letter was written to. And the response of the congregation was to start to shrink back and drift away in some of their faith. And the reason why was because in Roman society, the Jewish religion was a recognized religion with some protections, but Christianity was not. And so once you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, you come out from under some of those governmental and social construct of protections and you're kind of on your own. There's no protections for you. And so there was a risk to your business, to your family, to your life. And the temptation was, well, I can just say I'm a follower of Jesus and not just, not, maybe not be so public about it. And that's okay. And Jesus knows my heart, so everything's going to be okay. And the writer of Hebrews, just, he just pounds that right between the eyes. He says, no. You can't shrink back in your faith and still profess Jesus. What he has done either radically transforms your life or you aren't really following him. That's the start of Hebrews 1. The author uses the first chapter to boldly declare from Scripture, Old Testament, the supremacy of Jesus. And as we're going to see today in chapter 2, he starts introducing some warnings into what happens if you don't magnify Jesus as supreme over all things. So here's the book. It's a pastoral encouragement to don't drift in your faith. Don't lean into social norms or governmental pressure. Be robust in your demonstration and your obedience to Jesus. Don't shrink back because if you do, you run a far greater risk of the pressures of this world persecuting you. You might suffer eternal judgment. And that's the beauty of this letter. It is encouragement and it is warning, which is something that we saw in the book of Revelation as well. So this book is helpful on multiple levels for us because if you're in here today and your faith is starting to drift, then Hebrews has something for you. If you're sitting here thinking, I don't don't know if I believe God the way I did when I was younger, he kind of let me down in some areas. Man, I got good news. Hebrews is a good book for you. If you're at the place now where because of social pressures, your faith is starting to drift, this book is a good book for you. If you're at the place where you need a more robust education in the Old Testament, this book is for you. If you need a clearer view of the supremacy of Jesus, then Hebrews has something for you. And that is the reason why we are reading this book because this book contains some of the most amazing argumentation for the supremacy of Jesus over all things and the warning to us to trust that. Because if you don't lean into it, there's something on the other side of that. So, without further ado, Hebrews chapter one is an argument that Christ is superior over angels, and the argument is framed primarily from Christ's divine nature. Hebrews 2 continues that argument that Jesus is superior over angels, but the argument is framed from Christ's human nature. You ready to get into it? Good. Hebrews chapter 2, 
Let's start in verse one. We'll read a little bit, talk a little bit. You can know when I'm done reading because then I'll take my glasses off because then I can't see you. (laughs) Hebrews chapter two, verse one. It says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Now let's pause right there. Because this is a transition from the previous chapter. Now in the original letter, there weren't chapters and verses. Those were added later to help us reference where we are. But this break, the chapter two break, wasn't there in the original letter. So this word, therefore, is there to connect the previous argument with where he's drifting now, or where he's discussing what he's about to discuss now, which is drifting. And his argument is primarily this. This is the summary from last week. If Jesus is supreme over all things, then we have to start paying a closer attention to everything that he said. If he really is over the angels and the messages that the angels delivered, if he is greater than the prophets, then we have to start paying attention to what he told his disciples and his disciples told us. We have to start reading the word regularly. We have to start examining everything that we read in this book in the light of Christ. I have to start looking at my job differently. If I truly believe that Jesus is supreme over my career and my family and my destiny and my gifts and where I'm heading and my future and my past, then I have to start paying attention to what he has said about me and not what my middle school teacher said about me or not what my boss said about me or what my mom said about me. Are you following? If what chapter one says says is true, then we have to start paying closer attention to what we have read. And so that's the encouragement. Pay closer attention, and then comes the warning. Pay closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. Now that phrase, drift away, is interesting because it's the only place it's found in the New Testament. That phrase, drift away, is a phrase that is The closest way to think about how that phrase came about is to think about a boat that's sitting next to a dock and it isn't tied to the dock. Eventually, it just kind of drifts away. The boat isn't trying to drift away and the person who owns the boat isn't pushing the boat away, it's just drifting away which means that the argument being made in the first verse is really important to us because it's not talking about conscious disbelief. It's not just saying, well, one day I believed in Jesus, the next day I just say, well, I don't believe any of this stuff. What it's warning you against is a ongoing drift doing it where you say, well, well, that's not important. I'll forsake the gathering of the people because I'll just stay at home and watch it on TV. I, I, don't, I don't need to read what's in here. I've already read the Bible. I read through it once. I know what it says. I don't, I don't have time to pray today. I, I'm not going to pursue holiness. I, I really want to indulge my flesh. The warning of the first verse is if you don't pay close attention to your Christian walk, If you aren't regularly regularly revisiting what he said and what others have said about him coming, you will drift away. That's the warning, but the warning gets even stronger because in the next verse, we're about to find out that drifting doesn't just lead to unbelief. Drifting can ultimately lead to punishment. So here's the warning. When you put your Christian life on autopilot, when you decide to stop being proactive about the things of God, you're not going to head towards him. You're going to drift from him, and you're ultimately going to shipwreck your faith. So let's get into verse 2. 
Now, this is directly connected to one. We were just told, pay closer attention or you're going to drift away, lest you drift away. Verse two, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect a great salvation? That word escape Every place it's used in the New Testament refers to escaping judgment. Escaping the coming judgment that Christ is bringing on the world at his return. That's what that word is, uh, that's the weight of that word is carrying. How could we possibly escape such a, if we neglect such a great salvation? See, it was declared at first by the Lord. No, what was declared? this great salvation. And it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witnesses by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Let's pause right there. The writer of Hebrews has encouraged us and then warned us, and his warning includes making a big deal of what we have gotten in Jesus. And he starts by comparing it with this message we got from angels. Now this might be weird for some of us. Because when we read through the Old Testament, we're reading through uh, um, Exodus, we're reading through Deuteronomy, and we're seeing the Mount Sinai account, our takeaway from this is like, okay, God showed up in person, and he just spoke to Moses, and the, he gave them the law, and then that's it. But if you look in Deuteronomy 33, 2, we're told that that message, those, that law, was spoken by God, but delivered through angels. These angels were the intermediaries that were there, present when the law was given, and it was given by God through them. This is referenced also in Acts 7, 53, and Galatians 3, 19. So what the writer of Hebrews is arguing is, we on Sinai, as a Jewish people, received a law that was legal and binding. And it was legal and binding because God, as a judge, he enacted this law and there were witnesses around that saw that we agreed to this law. The witnesses were the angels. They actually delivered the message. So we've got this amazing thing that we as Jews kind of frame our whole life around. This moment on Sinai, the law, this is the big deal. This is the, this is it. It was legal, it was binding, it was good, it was reliable. But then we have this other message that was delivered to us by Jesus, who I just argued for the first chapter, is greater than angels. And not just we have this amazing moment on Sinai with the angels and with God for the first message. The second message was delivered by God himself in human form. And not only that, it was testified by everyone who heard Jesus. This is just a sidebar. One of the reasons why um, uh, I think that the writer of Hebrews probably wasn't like a Paul or, or one of the original apostles because Paul likes to speak about himself in the first person a lot. He likes to argue for his apostleship and that he actually was, Jesus visited with him and spoke to him personally. But in verse three, it says, we're talking about this thing that first was declared by the Lord, and then it was attested to us by those who heard. So the writer of Hebrews is probably somebody who knew and was close to somebody that that was an apostle. My, My hypothesis is that whoever wrote this probably had a really good conversation with the disciples on the Emmaus Road. Remember when Jesus shows up after his resurrection and we're told that he walks in the Emmaus Road and he starts back with the Old Testament, back with the law, and from the law all the way through the prophets, he walked these disciples through everything and showed them how all of the stuff that was spoken of before Christ was finally fulfilled. Hebrews sounds like a Cliff's Notes of that conversation. That's just a side note. 
But the author of this book is arguing that we have this amazing thing delivered to us by angels, but we also have this other amazing message delivered by a guy who I just told you is greater than angels. It was testified to us by people who knew him. It was also confirmed by signs and wonders and miracles, and it was also confirmed with a distribution of gifts from the Holy Spirit. So here's the argument in these verses. Israel received a binding message through angels, and they were held accountable. How much more are we held accountable now that we have received a better message from Jesus? In that original message, there were warnings. Don't drift from this. There are um, repercussions and judgments if you hear this message and you don't follow it. Here's the command. If you don't follow the command, there's a judgment that comes along with it. How much more should we hear and obey the message delivered to us by Jesus himself if we don't want to suffer the repercussions of ignoring it? That's a lot of weight on this message. He's argued that Jesus is superior to some of the greatest things in the Old Testament book. Then how much more should we take it seriously if he is greater than all those things? So, so the idea that your Christian life is this thing where somebody just told you, well, just pray a prayer and you're good. You're good. That's baloney. That's just the beginning. The entire New Testament is littered with this encouragement for the saints to persevere. Don't give up. Keep going. We saw that all in Revelation. The perseverance of the saint. Don't give up. Keep believing. You believed at the beginning? Good. Keep believing. Don't stop in the middle because if you do, you run the risk of being in a worse situation than you were originally when you first believed. How could you possibly escape such a marvelous salvation if you treat it less than this message delivered to us by angels? Now, this idea of persevering in your faith so that you can escape the coming judgment is explored a little more in verse 5. Let's go to verse 5, Hebrews 2, 5. It says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. Now just pause briefly right there. I didn't realize this is what we were talking about. So it's a good thing the writer of Hebrews clarified that. Did did you catch what he said there? He's going back and he's subtly referencing, I'm still talking about Jesus' supremacy over the angels, but what I'm arguing for is the coming world to come. I am certainly talking about his supremacy now, but I'm mostly talking about this world to come. So that's the parameters for what we're discussing here. So when I warn God's people, hey, Continue in your faith. Don't drift. Because you run the risk of suffering judgment. What judgment are we talking about? We're talking about the judgment that he's bringing on the world when he returns to establish the next world to come, the new heavens and the new earth. That's the parameters that the author of Hebrews is framing out in verse 5. And he says, it wasn't to the angels that God subjected the world to come. Christ is superior over angels, but he didn't come and die for angels. He came and died for humanity. And I want you to understand that the world to come is what Christ came to bring about. So that's the parameters here. And what he's about to do, he's about to make an appeal from Psalm 8 that the creation that we see currently isn't functioning the way it was intended to because of sin. And so Christ came to do a thing to establish something new in his people so that in the world to come, it will be like it was before sin entered into the world. Are you following me? Because the argument that the writer of Hebrews is making is that Christ is superior over angels, but what he did was not just be superior over angels in divine form, he was superior over angels and all mankind in human form. 
Now, what's about to happen here is really helpful for us because what we're about to watch is how New Testament writers read the Old Testament in light of Jesus. And this is important for us because when you go back in and you read through the Old Testament, you should be reading it through a lens of Jesus. The event of Christ transforms and illuminates everything we read in the Old Testament. And a Psalm of David is one example of that. So let's get into this. This is verse six. Hebrews two, verse six. It says, it, it has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? Now just a pause right there. He's not saying it has been testified somewhere because he doesn't remember where this verse is. All right, this is the writer of Hebrews. This guy quoted like seven Old Testament verses just in the first chapter. The reference hasn't slipped his mind. He knows exactly where it is, but he's saying testified somewhere so as to not, a call, not to call attention to the writer of the psalm, but to call attention to the fact that God spoke through the writer of the psalm to make a point that we are only now really understanding in the light of Jesus. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. All right, now I want you to jump over to Psalm 2 real quick. Oh, sorry, Psalm 8. What he's quoting is four through six of Psalm eight, but I wanna read Psalm eight in its entirety, it's only nine verses, because what David is doing is he's arguing for what he sees as the supremacy of mankind over creation. He sees a divine order when he looks out. He's like, man, I, I see the heavens and the stars, and these, these are pretty amazing things that you created. Who is man that you would make him a little bit lower than the angels in the scope of your creation, but put him over in dominion over all the earth? He's responsible for making sure that the, that the plants grow. He's over all of the animals. You put him in charge of earth. Who, who in the world did you, th- like, who are we that you would give us such heavy responsibility to rule in your state? dead. Let's read that. Verse 8, or excuse me, verse 1 of chapter 8. It's, this is a Psalm of David. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, and out of the mouths of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the son of man that you care for him. Now here's what's interesting. David isn't thinking Jesus in this verse. He's thinking who is mankind and the children of mankind that you would set them in a place a little lower than the angels but over all of your creation. But when we learn from Daniel, when Daniel says when I I saw the vision of this divine human being, he was like a son of man. Daniel was written after David, and so what we see is the story starting to unfold. David is writing in terms that God uses reference-wise to help us understand as we move forward. So when David wrote this, he's thinking, man, like, uh, who, who am I that you would give me charge of this kingdom? And who is my son that you would then give him charge? And then God says, yeah, 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 yeah. You're on the right track. You're on the right track. You're thinking, you're thinking, sons? Yeah, I got a son for you. Are you seeing this? 
So the writer of Hebrews calls this out. We'll go back to it in a minute, but I want you to keep seeing what David is writing. He's writing in verse five. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. David's thinking mankind little lower than heavenly beings. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put him all these things under his feet. David's thinking you've given dominion of creation to mankind, sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the heavens, fish of the, uh, fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Then the writer of Hebrews looks back at Psalm 8, now go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, and we're told, what is man that you are mindful of him for the son of man that you care about him? Hebrews is interpreting David's language through David, and then he says, but there's something else. So listen to how he's writing this. Verse 6, what is man that you are mindful of him that you are mindful of mankind? or the son of mankind that you care for him. You made him, mankind, a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. The writer of Hebrews is thinking, okay, I'm tracking with David. I know what he's saying. He put everything under subjection under his feet. Now putting in control everything in subjection under his feet, there's just one problem. I don't see everything in subjection under his feet. So I'm reading David, I know scripture is true, and I, I know that you're telling me that you made mankind in order to rule over your creation but I ain't seeing that. I'm not seeing mankind rule. What I'm seeing is mankind is a slave. So how is it that I can look at that text and know that it's true when everything I see says the opposite? And then in verse 9, but then we see him. Who's him? Jesus. Jesus makes that text true. Because for a while, a little while, he was lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned for glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. What is he saying? He's saying Jesus is superior over the angels, and he's superior over mankind, because when David looked at mankind, he saw an order that was broken, and in order to restore that order, a man had to come in and function in the place to resolve all of that dysfunction. There had to be a man who came in the created order and functioned as one who was made a little lower than the angels, but was given dominion over all creation, and that man would ultimately be the man who stood in for all of mankind. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, when you read Psalm 8, you can't read it in light of mankind because it isn't true. But when you read it in the light of Christ, all of a sudden Christ becomes this representative for all mankind that makes these things absolutely true. And here's the fascination of the way that God tells the story from the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see these things being written and we're like, wow, oh, there's, there's, like I, I see what you're doing there, but there's some anticipation because it's not, it's not really true. When you made the promise to David that, that his son would sit on a throne forever. Solomon died. So like, so like, where's the son that's gonna rule forever? Do you see that anticipation? This anticipation lasted for 500 years. And so as you read through the book, you're like, all right, I see these promises and I see them fulfilled in a little bit, but then if I look at those promises in the light of Christ, boom, it's like a nuclear bomb goes off. All of a sudden, everything fits. There's only one way to look at Scripture and the world and your life and for everything to make sense, and that is through the lens of Jesus. And that's the invitation the writer of Hebrews is giving us in 6 through 9. We see Jesus made a little lower than the angels, but then magnified as he ascended. He's now sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is crowned with glory, and he's ruling over creation. And we see it true now, but there is still some components where mankind isn't free. So the full fulfillment of this is in the world to come. Now the question he poses next is essentially, how does this happen? How is it that some man could become the mankind for all mankind? 
We talked in our message series on Revelation about how Jesus became the true Israel that Israel couldn't be. The writer of Hebrews is now arguing that Jesus became the man that mankind could never be. How did he do that? Why did he do that? Why did he take on human flesh? How did that come about? It came about through suffering and death. Because if you're going to be the true representative of mankind, for all mankind, you have to experience everything that mankind experiences. And that includes suffering and ultimately death. Now this is gonna tie in later in the chapter on why he has such credentials to be the high priest, the representative before God for all mankind. How is it that he can stand before a holy God and say, on behalf of mankind, look at me, not them. It's because he experienced everything mankind had to offer and he passed every test that came his way. He was the mankind that mankind could never be. So let's get into verse 10. It says, for it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. It was fitting for all creation for the creator to come down and be a representative of all. Who would be the one representative for mankind? Well, it it wasn't Israel, they failed. Who could be the one representative for, for mankind? Well, it had to have been the creator. There's only one person that could stand in for the creation and that was the creator. But, it, but a couple things happened when he did this. A few things became true when he took on human flesh and he was born of a virgin. Verse 11, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he says he is not ashamed to call them brothers. By coming to mankind and becoming like a man, becoming human, becoming a man, he then, by adopting other people into the family, became brothers to us. Jesus is like our brother. Not even like, Jesus is our brother. That's what the writer is saying. And then he says, and then he uses some Old Testament verses to to argue for this. Verse 12, saying, this is Psalm 22, 22, I will tell your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. That's a quote from David saying, I will tell of my, to my brothers the faithfulness of God. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, man, that may have been true when David said it, but it's even more true when Jesus stood in that place as a greater king than David ever was and declared to his brothers who are now us the glories of of the Father. That's pretty amazing. The way that the writer is taking texts that this community is familiar with, texts that some of us are familiar with, some of us might not be familiar with, and saying these things are true, but they're even more true in light of Christ. He fulfilled these things, and he didn't just forgive your sins. What he's offering you is to become part of his family. He wants to be a brother to you which speaks to the different components of God's character. Yes, he forgave you of your sin. Yes, you have become part of his family. Yes, in a sense, we are slaves to Christ. But in another sense, he's our father and Jesus is our brother. In some sense, the kingdom of God is like a family, not some organization that you pay a due to. It's a family. Now, for some of us, it's like, well, that's not helpful. My family is dysfunctional. (laughs) Well, that's not on him. That's on your family because he sets the tone for what family is supposed to look like and we're supposed to mirror it. We're the ones who are broken, not him. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children that God gave me. That's a quote from Isaiah 8, 18. The prophet Isaiah is saying, my children will stand in society as a symbol that God loves his people and gave me children. The the writer of Hebrews is saying, read that quote from Isaiah as though it's coming through the lips of Jesus and think about how true that is for you today. 
Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now what he's doing here is he's arguing that in Jesus taking on human form, a couple things became true. First and foremost, that you were adopted into a family and he's like a brother to you now. The second thing that's true is that in his work in suffering and death, he destroyed the works of Satan. Everything Satan started in the garden has been destroyed in Christ. But here's my favorite verse 15. We're gonna come back to this in a minute. I'm gonna read through the end of it. But he says, and, this is one of the things that Christ did, deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Mm, that's fascinating because what it doesn't say is that we were slaves to death. It says we were slaves to the fear of death. We'll come back to that. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. That's important because this work that Christ did isn't for the angels and it's not for just any old Joe Blow walking down the street. It is for the descendants of Abraham. The work of Christ is for those who are part of God's kingdom, not just any person who says, well, any God will get you to heaven. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. That's why the suffering and the death had to transpire, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Merciful towards us, us and faithful towards God. Now we'll get into the high priest later because that's a big argument that he has, but essentially a priest is a representative of the whole. What you're thinking here in Hebrew culture is that at Sinai, God says, all of you, come to me. And they say, oh, we don't want the, uh, the, the lightning, the, 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 the fire, it's a scare in the children. How about we just have a representative? Moses, you go. That established a culture in God's economy with Israel that the, the people didn't approach. They rejected that offer, so there was a representative that approached God on behalf of the people. So a priest would stand before God once a year and say, I'm offering these sacrifices on behalf of these wicked people who won't listen to you and constantly complain. I'm a representative of them here saying, I want to atone for their sin by this sacrifice. That's what a priest is. It is one who stands fully understanding all of the pain of the people before a holy God and says, I will be the stand-in. That's the priest. And the writer of Hebrews is arguing that Jesus, by becoming a brother, by taking on human flesh, by suffering and dying, fulfilled every requirement of what it means to be man so that he could stand before a holy God on your behalf, on your behalf, and say, I am here on behalf of Matt. I'm here on behalf of Tyler. Tyler's not gonna stand before you and say, I'm gonna go it on my own. I think I've got more things in the good category than the bad category. He don't. So I'm here on his behalf, and I'm offering my blood, and I will take his sacrifice for him, to make a propitiation for the sins of the people. This is a controversial word. It's a word that means washing away the sin and satisfying the wrath of God that was coming your way as a sinner. That's funny because that word, some commentary, some theologians, some church is like, oh, I don't wanna talk about the wrath of God. He's a loving God. So we're not gonna go there. Propitiation means just washing away. Look, I, I don't know what to tell you, but that, read the book of Revelation. There's a lot of wrath coming towards those who practice wickedness. And the work of Christ washed away the sins and satisfied that wrath on our behalf so it's not coming our way. Praise Jesus. So when Jesus stands before a holy God and he says, I'm here on Bobby's behalf, I'm here on Sarah's behalf. That reality should just ring around in our heads 
and just upset us because what the writer of Hebrews is doing is saying Jesus is so supreme that what he chose to do was stand in your place as a representative of you before a holy God to take what was coming your way. (sighs) Some of y'all had some things coming your way. (laughs) I had some things coming my way. I'm glad he's standing before the Father and not me. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to argue. That it was fitting for all creation, for the creator to become this thing for us. To take on human flesh. To dwell among the brothers and call them family. To experience the temptations, the suffering, and even the death. And to not do this for angels, but to do this for his people. So what is the writer of Hebrews in 10 through 18 arguing that Jesus did, that he destroyed the works of the devil, he became the perfect representation for all mankind, and he came to set the captives free from the fear of death. This is where I wanna land just for the end of this. We're gonna, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it because I want you spending the rest of the week thinking on it. But this is where where we're gonna land today. That one of the things that Jesus did in the work of the cross and his resurrection was that he set you free from the fear of death. Now think about this for a minute. Mankind from Psalm 8 argues that we were given dominion over creation. Everything we see here on earth, mankind was given responsibility to steward it on God's behalf as his representatives. But we messed it up. We are not ruling over this creation in God's, uh, on God's behalf. We are being ruled by this creation. We are slaves to this creation. Now, what does the slavery come, what is, what is the primary form of the slavery? It's the reality that the ruling that we have over this creation will ultimately always come to an end because one day you will die. When mankind was created, there was no sense of death. They were just created to rule with God in partnership with him to be over his creation. There was no expiration date on that. The joy that was experienced by mankind when when man would walk with God in the cool of the evening, there was no expiration date on that. There was no ending to that. It would be forever. But then mankind sinned and started being ruled by creation and death and sin. And one of the things that came in was this thing called death, an expiration date for all of us, which means that right now, human beings, it doesn't matter how much joy they experience or how much fulfillment they achieve in life, they always know that it won't last forever. And some of you that, were, that are kind of young in here, you're like, mm, uh, I, mean, I don't know, I got a long time to live. When you're young, you don't think about death. You don't, you don't think about an expiration date. You're thinking, I, I'm, I've got years, years. And the, the further you get on in your life, you're like, oh, I don't got years. And then the enemy likes toying with humanity because he invents this thing called the 24-hour news cycle and the internet. And now you're bombarded by this thing. Every time you pick it up, somebody else died. Man, this person was just going to get gas and they died. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't go get gas anymore. This person, they, they went on a mission trip and they didn't come back. Or they went and did this, or they went and did this, or, 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 they, or they, you know, God forbid, they went outside and they got sick. And then then they died. And it's fear, and it's fear, and it's fear, and it's fear, and it's never ending. And all it is is the same thing. It's a constant reminder that you have an expiration date. That it doesn't matter how much you achieve, or how close you get to your family, or how good things get, it doesn't matter. It's gonna end one day and you're sitting at a birthday party or you're sitting at Thanksgiving and it's Christmas and you're sitting around and all of your loved ones are around like, man, isn't this great? We could do this forever. This is, and then there's this black cloud looming in the corner 
reminding you it's not gonna last forever. The fear of death is what makes us a slave. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is speaking to us about. Because here's what the Bible says about that. You have been set free from the fear of death. Listen to, listen to me. You do not have to be afraid of death anymore. Now we hear that and we're like, amen, that's good. But... You know why? You know why that but is there? Because we know it, but we don't believe it. This is why some of you make some of the decisions that you make because you're afraid if you don't, this thing's gonna happen. It's why some of you haven't done what God told you to do because you're afraid of what might happen. I, I can't send my kid there. I can't go there. I can't say yes to this. Let me ask you a question. What would your life look like if you weren't afraid of dying anymore? What would you say yes to? Because here's the other thing about the fear of death. It's the way that humans control one another. I want you to think back way into the Middle Ages when like kings had castles and stuff. When a foreign king with his army comes to your gates and says surrender and you say no, the response is, all right, well, I'm gonna burn your castle to the ground. All right, well, I'm still not gonna surrender, okay. Then I'm gonna burn your whole kingdom to the ground. All right, I'm still not gonna surrender. What is the triple dog dare in humanity? I'm gonna kill you. That's what it always is. I'm gonna take all your money. Well, I don't like that, but okay. I'm gonna take your house, take everything from, okay. I don't like that, but okay. You can't one up higher than I'm going to take your life. And that's what makes us slaves. And here's the good news, church. And it's as simple as this. You don't have to be afraid of dying. One of the things that Christ bought for you in his death and resurrection is freedom from the thing that all humanity is haunted by. And that's not just death, because we will all die one day, but the fear of death. Because what Christ did inside of you, hear me, is he turned death into a doorway. I want that to just settle for a second. Because for, listen, I, I know it, like, some of you are sitting there like, man, you don't know what you're talking about. You haven't experienced death. You haven't lost someone close to you. You haven't lost a child. You haven't lost whatever. I understand the rebuttal. I have some rebuttals to you, but now's not the time for that. All I want to do is not argue from what my experience is or from what I've seen or what I know. I only want to argue from the Bible. And here's what the Bible says. The writer of Hebrews is telling you that you don't have to be afraid of dying anymore. And you need to spend the next six months thinking about the implications of that because that's not something that you just turn over and like, oh, that was cute. That's, that's sweet. Man, wasn't, that was right. That was true. No, no, no. This should burrow deep on the inside of you because there are things that are controlling you that are rooted to the fear of death that you don't even realize because, and I was having a conversation with somebody earlier this week about this. I'm convinced that every form of slavery in some form or fashion has its roots in the fear of death. Why are you addicted to that substance? Why are you addicted to that person? Why are you addicted to that way of talking? Why are you addicted to that thing that you're looking at? 
because a lot of it is rooted in your pleasure and you know your pleasure won't last forever. So you're arguing for yourself. I might as well enjoy it now. Seize the day. Let me just have what I want right now because I know I'm not promised tomorrow. That's the fear of death haunting you and Christ set you free from that. So here's the, here's the encouragement. Church, today's the day where you start making a decision to no longer be afraid of dying. Let's pray.